Well, hello and welcome to what is the 141st episode of the Adoption and Fostering Podcast with me, Al Coates, and him, Scott Catton Rennie. How the hell are you, Scott? I'm good. Well, yeah, I'm all right. How are you? <laughs> that was so resounding. That was so, and it was uh, like, yeah, all right. I, I, I just feel like we haven't spoken for a I know we've, we, because we normally text a couple of times a day, mm-hmm. and this last couple of weeks, you've been so busy. I have been busy. That. I do, I feel like I'm walking around going, ooh e al, ooh e al, which is French oh, for very al. Yeah. Um, in case you didn't know, because I know you don't speak French, do you? Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I'm kind of, dare I say, it, I don't know if I even want to say this because it's just making my skin crawl thinking it, but I've kind of missed you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, oh I just, Scott, yeah, man. Normally, normally we're texting and we're not texting. Oh, and I'm I not got anyone else. No, no. <laughs> I'm not. There's not another in my life. It's, it's still you. You're still the one. Oh, and yeah, and I'm a bit bored at okay. the minute, and I've had to cut back a little bit again, and you know that's oh. all. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've so. been in that London, and here's my segue. See what I do. Mm, yeah, yeah. I've been in that London, uh, which is where our guest this evening, who's sitting very, very patiently and quietly yeah. in the corner. I've been at London this week, and it's been so hot. I've gone into full northern. I literally just walk around going, bah, yeah, it's never been this warm in Northumberland. <laughs> I don't know why I was speaking Yorkshire accent. I actually do. I do. Um, so it's, I've just been like outrageously, just like a blancmange everywhere. So it's great to get back up north and it was raining and it's 18 degrees. So it's oh. beautiful. Oh. Yeah. So we, we, we've not been too bad, but um, yeah, it's shorts weather, isn't it? Shorts with oh. a jumper, that's me. Yes, I even bought some smart shorts. Oh, my days. Yeah, very, very pleased with myself. But do you know the best thing about, about working in your own yeah. office, in your own What's office that? where you are the boss, is you can wear whatever the frig you like, and I love that. Because I've literally, I'm going in with my fashionable torn shorts on and, you know, my my my, <laughs> my white ankle socks and whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's fabulous. Love it. Oh, don't draw me on the rocks of ankle socks, because you know how I feel about socks. I've got very <laughs> determined opinions about socks. I'm a man of a certain age. No, no, it's, um, not, it's not just ankle socks. It's fashion generally. Sorry, just let's do you know, oh, anyway. no, I'm not going to get drawn into this, because this I've got. I think we need an episode where we catch up on all of the things that's going on. But yes, this is right. not this episode. No, it's People not. People have okay. tuned in. To, um, but, we're in the top 20 podcasts of parenting podcasts in Britain today. So just I thought you'd tell you that, top 20. Oh, are we? Oh, fabulous. Yeah, it must be a slow That's... podcast week. No, I'd, I would probably suggest it's because we had a minister on a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, let's not go there. We'll go, we'll go into that further on in the podcast. Let's go in that. <laughs> well, well, I'm going to end it sat very quietly in the virtual corner. We've um, we've got a rather smashing guest. Um, we've got the wonderful Rob Leach, who is an adoptive parent and a head teacher. So it's always nice to get a head teacher on. Hello, Rob. Hello. Great to be here. I didn't want to interrupt the, the loving that was taking place a minute ago, but it's lovely to be here. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Uh, you are. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely to have you. And um, the reason we got you on was because we I saw um, something fizzing around uh, in relation to a campaign or a petition, an online petition that you'd started through the, the you know, is it Change.org? I can't remember now. It is Change.org, isn't it? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, we've actually got our one on the parliamentary sort of petition website, but it's right. all linked to Change, yeah. Cool. And we'll get links, details to that. But before we start any of that, tell us about who you are and how you ended up being who you are now. Oh, it's a big question. I'll try and um, yeah. summarise it for everyone so it doesn't go on for hours. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm really lucky. We, I've got four incredible adopted children, along with my husband, Matt, um, and we adopted our kids uh, sort of four or five years ago now. Um, and it's been, as it is with any uh, adopter, it's such an incredible, unique journey that you go on. Um, and... Uh, and all of our kids are just so different. Uh, they've all got slightly different stories. They're all related. They're all birth siblings or half siblings. Um, but they've all had such different stories in their lives. Uh, and since they've come to us and we've tried to muddle our way through as parents to these four, um, uh. you know, we, we've had to go down different pathways. And one of the pathways for one of our children has been to try and secure him the support that he needs in terms of his education with his additional needs that he has. Um, and so to experience sort of firsthand 
as a parent, what that's like to try and get the support for your child that you know they need, you can see they need, um, has been really quite revealing, particularly because, as you say, I am also in education as a teacher and a head teacher, and have seen it from a different sort of side of the table. To be on both sides of that table has been really quite revealing. And that's why we've wanted to try and draw attention to this campaign, to try and make it easier and more straightforward for care experienced children to get the support they need. You're like a walking soundbite, aren't you? You're just, you, that was, the, that was like a, you summed, you went from beginning to end in three minutes. You should be on the telly. Was that good? Did you like that? Was that, was that smooth? I, yeah, you've been you on should training, be standing for a tell. prime minister or something. Oh, right? well, if oh, only yeah. there was a vacancy, eh? Hey? <laughs> if only we needed someone to just step in right now who could yeah. speak to speak, crikey. Um, right, so you've said, you've told me loads of things there. First of all, adopting four children isn't normal. Um, I, I, I can it's just not but technically you can't be approved for four children did you know that scott yes i did oh so tell i mean tell us that i didn't know that so that's news to me um no we um we we adopted three of our children um so when we went through the adoption process um completely naive uh as as you are stop 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 start at the beginning None of this, like, none of this politician speak. Start spinning. Why did you decide to adopt? Oh, we, we, we were just desperate to have kids. We really wanted to have Fair a enough. family. Um, and, and we really felt um, that we both had, we were both really lucky. We had great uh, childhoods ourselves. And we just wanted to give a bit of that back, really, and enjoy it. Um, so we, we started going through the process. And you go through the training, don't you? You go to, to the mm-hmm. different sessions, et cetera. And you have a social worker. We were really lucky with a great social worker. Um, and uh, and we sort of we were we were intrigued by the idea of siblings. We thought siblings um, would, would could be really great for each other throughout their lives. So we were sort of looking at that very sort of typical two children ideal, probably one boy, one girl, all of those things that you sort of picture. Um, and our social worker sort of came to the house one day and gave us this this profile which had had three children. We'd never considered going for three children at all from zero. Um, and uh we we just read the profiles we went through it with our social worker and it's one of those things you just fall in love you get hooked almost straight away oh yes um, and so we we ended up before you knew it the whole thing accelerated and suddenly we were there with with three kids social worker foster care is gone thinking to ourselves how on earth are we gonna do this um and i remember that yeah i think we all do we remember that first night when when the kids are with you and you sort of panic every minute of the night that something's going to go terribly wrong you don't sleep particularly um and then it was about 18 months after that just as they were beginning to, to really settle um and attach um that we had a phone call uh, sort of out of the blue and it was our social worker again who was calling to say they'd been um that the birth mother was pregnant again um, and, and therefore coming to see whether or not we would um, be, be willing, able, interested in, in, in bringing that child to us. And um, we thought really hard about that because you've got, you've got to you know, think about all the practicalities and the capacity, et cetera. Um, yeah. But in the end, we felt we, we could. Um, and so we were blessed when, uh, when, when she came to us as well. I mean, you've, again, you've summarised really quickly, but that, I mean, that is pr- quite a remarkable story going from four to right, zero to four in what 18 months two years or however long and i'm sort of intrigued were you both working full-time prior to the children moving in or um you because looking after three children is a lot of work Mm -hmm. and if there's two of you it's still a lot of work yeah no it is Uh, we're really lucky we've got a great support network it was always before we had kids we always had both our um me and matt our our parents both sort of lived uh, five ten minutes away from our house and it used to be a thing where we think, oh, God, it's all too close. We want to get away. We want to move away at some point. And then we got the kids and we're like, actually, it's brilliant. Um, we've got them on the doorstep. And, and I don't think we'd be able to do it without them. Um, and my one of my sisters is really close as well. So we're really lucky in that we've got you know, lot, lots of people around us who, who really do help us practically, as well as emotionally and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it was massive for us. We were both working full time before we adopted our, 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 our first three um and then i had a couple of weeks adoption leave when we adopted them um and then i went back to work um and my husband matt he took a year uh, of adoption leave um and then he went back to work but he went back to work 
three days a week. And so he did that for a while. And then when we uh, had the, the second sort of adoption of the fourth child, he then again took a year adoption leave. And he's more recently now gone back to work again three days a week. So sort of one, one and a half now between us. Wow. So, I mean, you're still relatively new adopters. So it's there's still lots of change ahead, I guess. And so um, what was it like then bringing one more child into a, I mean, what was clearly a busy household that then I always reflected because we're, we're, we've got quite a few children. Um, that's a strange way of describing it, isn't it? Um, we've got more than is appropriate. Um, more than should be allowed. <laughs> what was that, Scott? What was that? <laughs> more, yeah, you have. <laughs> um, and I was always really conscious that you reach this sort of critical mass where it is just, there's no way around it. It's just, it's 100% of you. You need everything. So what was it like though then, sort of a meeting the needs of this individual little person who was coming into a sort of a fairly settled family yeah it, it was really hard because um it it, it was the, the practicality bit but it was also for us we'd got through the nappies and bottles and then suddenly we were back ah. into nappies and bottles again and and it, sometimes you think oh yeah god i missed that phase it'd be great to go back to that phase and then when you do go back to it you think oh my god i can't wait until it's over again i want to get rid of the nappies i want to get rid of the bottles again etc um so yeah it, it brought all the challenges and the teeth and all those sort of things that we've sort of forgotten because as time goes on, you remember the good and you sort of forget conveniently some of the more challenging bits. <laughs> um, so for us, it sort of brought it all back. Of course, wouldn't, wouldn't change it for the world, but it's been challenging for sure. Um, really, and, and I was, I remember being really nervous in a way that I wasn't the first time around. And maybe that's just experience makes you a bit more <laughs> realistic about it, but I was much more apprehensive um I, I took a lot longer to sort of get my head around the idea of of, of going again effectively um mm. but again when you do see them it sounds really cheesy when you do see them together now um it, it you you wouldn't want it any other way you you see the yeah. bond you see the connection you see the you know the love between them you think actually it, it's worth it however challenging it is oh smashing so in in, in terms of um i'm just because i've been Looking forward to this one. Sometimes I just duck out of podcasts if it's boring guests and Al does them himself. I'm joking. Can't say I, don't that. Do, I don't do that. I don't. I really don't. Can't say that. <laughs> but, oh, no. but edu- <laughs> education. <laughs> is, I mean, in my for however long I've been a, a parent and then working in various um, areas of adoption enforcement, education is probably the biggest issue for families that yeah. they experience. And probably, I would say, maybe adoption support may be on a kind of even par with that, but probably comes under in a little bit lower. So what was what was your experience of of kind of special educational needs and um, the the kind of families that you've effectively become and and knows with additional needs, not just our families? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think for a long time, you sort of especially where, you know, without sort of um, being a typical teacher, especially where you feel like there's not enough money, not enough funding, not enough people, not enough capacity in schools, and you're working in in quite challenging circumstances sometimes. I think one of the things that always um, I sort of picked up on was you'd have these sort of, I always used to call them like the warrior parents. And these were parents that would (laughs) knock on the door and they would want a meeting straight away and they'd pick up the phone first and they'd email you any time of the day. And sometimes it felt like they were quite intense. And sometimes it's like, oh God, they're actually quite a bit aggressive. And and actually, you know, ooh, I've got a bit of an edge about dealing with them. And uh, and then when I went through the process of having a child that I was trying to get support for, I found myself becoming that very parent that was knocking on the door and picking up the phone and becoming that. I know parent. my rights. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You become that that one. You want to sort of be outside the school and and, and be lobbying and, and knocking on the door, etc. Um, and so you become that. And I, I, it is one of those things. It makes you appreciate a little bit more when you go through it yourself. Mm. Um, that these are just parents trying to do their best job for their for their yeah. kids and and trying to make their child stand out in a system where perhaps there isn't the capacity that's required to support all of them. And so you do have to try and shout the loud. You do have to try and get your foot in the door. And it shouldn't be like that, but it is. And yeah, you end yeah. up becoming that. And um, did you feel that you were treated as a parent or as a professional when you were doing that? Because that's, you know, that's something that I know from my professional experience, you know, and Al, I'm sure you're the same. Um, oh, yes. but, you know, you you kind of go in and, and they see you as a parent rather than maybe you, you're qualified to, to actually talk about what it is that, you know, you're there yeah. to talk about. 
Do you know what? It was really interesting because sometimes when we were going into the school or we were talking to other agencies, um, me and Matt would talk about this sometimes. It, sometimes it's just, we weren't just getting through to anyone. Mm-hmm. And it was always, Matt would always say, well, just, just tell them you're a head teacher locally. And, and it sounded awful because it felt like you were playing this card yeah. um, that yeah. you shouldn't be playing because it shouldn't need that. But yeah, there were times when probably I made sure I signed off on an email with a certain job title. So just to try and make sure that actually we might get some fair hearing or that people know that we know what we're talking about in the hope that might advance it and again you feel a bit guilty for doing that because you shouldn't need to yeah yeah, we absolutely did Mm. (laughs) i would take full advantage (laughs) yeah when it's when it's your kid you sort of you do whatever you can can't you and and suddenly you Mm. can relate to everyone that that, that's been in a similar position before and and in terms of your teaching experience then i mean what um you know obviously you've you've talked about the parents but what about children in the classroom i mean you know without going into too much detail obviously because i wouldn't want to you know get you into trouble but you know have you had that experience of you know kids chucking chairs and you having to get yeah. rid of them out of the classroom and all that sort of stuff you know yeah I, i've all i've always worked in schools um that have quite high levels of um students with additional needs but also students with a range of behavioral and emotional changes i've always worked in in, in contexts that I don't think are particularly well served by education um, in terms of policy very well at all. Um, and, and certainly worked in, in a number of areas and communities that are quite deprived as well. And so I remember when I first became head teacher in a physical school, um, I remember my first day uh, restraining three different children in three different instances and going home and thinking, whoa, this is, this is a different context for me to be in, um, a great context, a context that needs people that are willing to work really hard on it. But um, certainly that's the case. And now I'm head teacher of an online school um, and we have a, a significant proportion of our students, far higher than national average, who have additional educational needs as well and actually find our provision uh, a provision in which they can re-engage with their education without some of the barriers that they might face in physical school. So, yeah, definitely as a teacher, being in and around students with a range of additional needs um, and yeah. trying to support them with their with their own educational journey. And in terms of, I, I, I'm really interested in this one because I have a child who has additional needs, but we don't live in the UK, so it's very different. But <clears throat> um, online school during COVID, he thrived. It, it, is, is that something that, you know, the online, you might not have been there then, but is that something that has increased? Um, yeah, I think that the, the, the pandemic, when it came to education, the pandemic sort of forced everyone to upskill suddenly into what it's like to learn online in a way that perhaps people wouldn't have been quite ready enough to take that step initially. Mm-hmm. Um, so our school, um, um, I'm going to shamelessly plug it, my online school, and we have 1,200 students across 80 countries uh, around the world. Um, and we go from key stage two all the way to key stage five. So year three to year 13, we deliver the English national curriculum and, and uh, IGCSEs and, and A-levels and international A-levels. And you know, we have a whole range of students for different reasons across the world that come into our school. It might be that their families are expat. It might be yeah. um, that they're international sports stars, et cetera. It might be they live in regions of the world where there aren't good school systems, et cetera. But we also have about 50% of our pupils in the UK. And of those, there are a number of pupils who would have been school refusers in physical schools. They would have been students who experienced bullying. Uh, they might have anxiety or mental health challenges. Um, and actually, when you think of particularly as you go into secondary schools, the, the noise in corridors, the lesson changeovers, mm. the disruption, the bullying, the, the negative social interaction that you can have, actually yeah. providing high quality live teaching, but from the comfort of your own home for a number of students with additional needs or have experienced some form of trauma in their lives, that's real, really comforting and for their families as well. So the number of families we have who will say, you know, we never used to be able to get our, our child out the door. There used to be you know, tears and fights every morning, et cetera. And now they can get this really good education. They're getting great grades, but they're doing it from the comfort of their own home. And then they've got the socialization with the friends and the hobbies they do outside of school that they love. Suddenly, you know, we, we wish we could have found this earlier. So yeah, it serves a real purpose for some. It wouldn't be right for everyone, but it yeah. serves a real purpose for some. And mm-hmm. I think the pandemic has helped it become more mainstream as an option. Yeah. Oh, fair. It's actually really good to know. So you mentioned the, in your wonderful summary of, of your entire life in three minutes at the beginning, um, <laughs> you mentioned then your experience of, of seeking additional support for your, your own, one of your children. Um, it was then sort of, has, is that been the sort of the spark for you to then sort of raise this petition? So, I mean, I always wonder what makes someone sort of sitting at home watching telly go, I'm going to do a petition. So come on, tell us the story. 
I know you, you sound slightly like someone that that, that maybe is a, a little bit over the top or eccentric about something, but no, it, it was just that it was, it was the experience of trying to navigate the process. And I always thought to myself, I'm trying to navigate this process as someone who's in education. So actually I get the lingo and I get the, you know, the acronyms and I get all of that sort of stuff. And I'm still finding it really hard. And if I'm yes. finding it really hard, despite the fact that I'm a head teacher in a school, then actually you know, how difficult is this going to be for some people to, to navigate if they're new to the education world, if they haven't gone through that system before. Um, and for us, uh, our, our son uh, for whom um, we were trying to get support for, uh, as with so many children that have been in care at some point, had a number of needs that were, were, were through no fault of his own. He was um, badly neglected um, in his first couple of years. He had hyper mobility difficulties. He was over two years behind on every age expected um, benchmark in terms of his academic progress. He had huge speech and language delay, which was largely from a lack of care and moving him off puree food onto solid food when he was younger, etc. And so you think to yourself, goodness me, there's this, there's this child who's been through the care system, who had actually been in four different foster homes and separated from his siblings during those before he came to us. Cool. And actually, when we first applied for an educational health care plan, the local authority refused to assess him. They said he didn't meet threshold. And I remember thinking to myself, well, if he doesn't meet threshold, <laughs> then, then who will meet threshold? And actually, how can we get the support he needs in a timely way? Because again, as a head teacher, I used to see families that would lobby and petition and work really hard for their children. And, and be rejected and rejected. And they might eventually get there when their mm-hmm. child was 14 or 15 or 16, by which point they are so far behind, it's too late, frankly. Yeah. And so to try and do it with the urgency that's required um, is really important. And that's where care experienced children miss out because often because yeah. of their experience in care, they are far more at risk of delayed identification of special educational needs and therefore much further back before they actually get to the point of being assessed and then potentially granted extra support for an educational healthcare plan. Um, I pulled at that. That makes perfect sense. And obviously being a teacher, you'll have seen that firsthand. Um, And I pulled up some stats um, off, I can't remember where it was now, but off Mr. Google. Um, Something, so in 2019... Some random website. Some random, yeah. um, Stats for podcasters' website. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> for dummies. Um, in 2019, 56% um, of children, of looked after children, had a special educational need compared to about 15% of the general population and 46% of children in need. Um, 27% of all looked after children have an e- have an education health care plan. Um, th- nearly 30% have SEN support. Um, I'm just going through... Um, I think the one stat which kind of shocked the heck out of me was um, in relation to uh, that the look that when parents sort of petitioned and uh, appealed decisions, only 168 out of 4,800 were upheld, and they were overturned by tribunals. Send this to tribunals. Yeah. So in in that context, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? Or is it? I, I think it is. I think. Look, I think. A lot of people would agree with the principle, which is the key test for any society is how it treats its most vulnerable people. And if you then follow that train of thought and you say, okay, well, care experienced children, however long they've been in care for, whatever the context of them going into care, if you follow that train of thought, you say, well, as you say, around half of them will have SEND compared to around 15% of, of their peers. When you look at it and say, well, okay, care experienced children are more likely to experience delayed identification. If you follow it through to the education side, you say, well, actually, um, less than half will achieve a nine to five or A star to B in, in, in old money, yeah, English and maths, and are five times more likely to be suspended than their peers. If you follow that through, you say, well, actually, care experienced children are therefore vulnerable children and vulnerable people mm. in society. You then add a layer, I think, uh, which is the, the key premise here, which is, I believe all care experienced children have experienced trauma of some type of yeah. some extent. If they have been in the care system for any reason, for any length of time, they have experienced some level of trauma. You look at the four main categories for special educational needs, they're cognition and learning, communication and language, physical and sensory needs, 
And the final one, social, emotional, and mental health. Well, if yep. we're saying that children have been in the care system are likely to experience trauma, then they are likely to have some form of social, emotional, and mental health, let alone it's other yeah. areas of special educational needs. So for me, absolutely, they are far more likely to be at risk of having additional learning needs. Um, and therefore, we should do everything in our power to speed up the process for them to get that identification and or support if it's appropriate. I sometimes, um, the ba- one of the barriers I've seen is, and we had this in relation to one of our children, was that my my child was, was academic. And so when the conditions were perfect, they were able to do well. And so we sort of were lobbying quite hard to keep those conditions perfect. <laughs> and an education healthcare plan would be that. And they said, but she, because she's academic, there's no need. And you're saying, but in every other aspect in school life, she's absolutely not, she's, she's not doing very well at all. And, um, ultimately, she did get one, but that was like you say, it was a fight. It was in year, um, year, year eleven. She got one. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think you're right, and I think local authorities. And again, it's not, it's not a blame game here. I think local authorities would turn around and say they don't have the capacity or the funding to to, to meet the need. Um, but as a consequence of that, what it can feel like, I think, to families is that they're very quick to say no and to try and brush off and give an excuse as to why not. And you're yeah. right. You could be academically on point, but there are other areas of your development where actually um, you do have real difficulties. And, and within the legislation, within the law for, for granting educational health care plan, those things matter just as much as the cognition and learning bit. So you can be academically on point, but there can be the social, emotional, mental health needs that can justify granting educational health care plan. But how many families will be brushed off at that first inquiry and therefore feel like actually, OK, we can't get one and, and therefore we don't go back? It, you know, yeah. it shouldn't be a case that the people who, who you know happen to know the most or can shout the loudest are the only ones that get the the outcome they need. But that is unfortunately what happens. Do you think that's in part because the school sort of make the application, don't they normally? And so, yeah, yeah, if, You're if right. education I mean, is their is their is their thing. Yeah, it's really interesting because we actually applied for one as parents. Um, we didn't go through the school, and and it was again really typical. You know, especially during COVID, high staff absence from schools, high staff turnover in schools generally. We were trying to meet with a different Senko every other week when they sort of got appointed and newly appointed, etc. And local authorities would like applications to come through schools, but you can apply directly as a parent. Um, and we did it because we felt like actually there's no one in the school who's stable enough or consistent enough in order to support us with this. So we're going to go it alone. Yeah. Um, and again, that did always cause a little bit of uh, reaction from the local authority but you're perfectly entitled to to do that um if you feel like actually the school approach isn't going to work for you i mean you've got i mean yeah as i and i think that reflected because we were we a few people have talked about it um on twitter today and one of the things i saw i got this real sense of families exhausted by it so that feels like for a lot of families that's just not capacity and then but if we're thinking about looked after children when we're not necessarily talking about children with champions uh, social workers do their job, but this might be a battle they're just not able to take on. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's really important. I mean, we use the term care experience children. It might be the foster carer really believes that they they, they should have an educational health care plan. It might be the social worker really believes they should. It might be you know their permanent uh, adoptive parents might do. And actually, it's about that idea. You don't, you shouldn't have to wait. Often, what happens is that professionals think, "Oh, we'll wait until they are in placement. We'll wait until they've gone through the court system. We'll wait until they've got permanence. Uh, we'll wait for a period of you know, attachment, and that's the priority." And yeah. suddenly, you add up all of these months and years, and it gets to that point that we said earlier. You're so far down the line that actually a lot of the challenges and barriers to education are become so set by that point that it becomes even harder to retrieve through any support package later on. So, again. If we're saying that because of the context of being in care, the de- likelihood is that there'll be delayed identification of SEN and delayed application for an assessment for an educational health care plan, then we need to quicken that process. And that's why yeah. this campaign seeks to say that if you have been in care, if you're a care experienced child, then you should automatically have the right to be assessed, not necessarily to have an educational health care plan, but to yeah. be assessed. And we also use the phrase in the petition of upon request. Because, again, we don't want everyone to feel like it's an obligation that if you've been in care, you have to have an assessment. It is upon request that there is a right, an automatic right, to get to that assessment stage. 
um, because of the the context that you've been you've been through the care system. And therefore, there's a heightened risk of your vulnerability. So, um, just because I want to clarify this, are we are you saying then, or uh, that this can be at any point that you know if there's a, a need in four years, if, even if they've had one like this year, that they can have another one in four years? It, I, I mean, just to be clear. Yeah, it's a really good point. Absolutely. I think that um, it's upon request at, at any point during their education where you feel as if there are significant barriers to their progress and their well-being, um, and actually that some of that would have been contributed to by their time in care. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. No, that's good to know. Um, so, um, I mean, this is something, actually, I have to admit that my dearest husband was cracking on about 10 years ago. And I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. They'll never do it because they'll never be able to afford it. So, I think that your petition. I mean, I, we have, we have. Sorry, we have. We don't have because one of them is twenty three now. Um, he had a statement, and then that converted over to an HCP, and we um, went through all every year. You know, the same thing about getting it, uh, getting it. What's his name? The review. Mm. The head teacher saying, "Don't worry, he doesn't. He's not that bad. He just sounds bad on the." bit of paper because we have to make them sound worse to keep the support and blah blah blah. and then actually going for an ehcp when they first came in for our youngest son when we lived there as well but what 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 effectively would this um because i'm looking at i've I've got the the petition up here now and it's on the the parliament website and we will share the link to that um so far you've got 3067 signatures and it runs it, it runs for a good while as well so that's that's a positive. But what do you see and how do you see us trying to kind of help to, to, to get this up to 10? Well, it would be nice to say 100,000 signatures, but 10,000 signatures would be yeah. enough just to get them to kind of make start. And I think we're such, we're, we're quite niche, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember when when um, I drafted this, someone said to me, it's, it's quite niche and um, yeah, you'll be lucky to get sort of 500 signatures. That, that was the sort of initial target. So you can imagine when it first went live, I was sort of checking it every five minutes and just <laughs> pick up one or two, we 500, almost had a party. Um, uh, so I never thought it would get to 3,000 um, at all. But whilst it, it sounds niche because of the language and the acronyms, actually what this is saying is that any child that has been in the care system for any length of time, should have the right to be assessed for additional support. Yeah. If we, if we yeah. put it in more in blunt terms. And actually that I think becomes far um, more widely accessible. Actually it lands better in terms of who this is for. And it's a wider origins. Um, and so it sounds a little bit less niche perhaps if you take some of the acronyms out of it um, for sure. And I think that you know, for us, it's about trying to raise awareness. We also coincide this with the, the SEN the review that's ongoing at the moment. So the government's got a consultation out at the moment. It finishes or closes on the 22nd, so just over a week's time from when we're talking about this now. Um, and so a lot of our um, people that have been supporting this campaign have been have been responding to that. We really want to try and influence policymakers. And as ever, when you try and do a campaign like this, people will say, oh, you know, people won't, you know, the politicians won't sign up to it because cost. It's going to cost more. Yeah. Um, I think the way we've tried to look at this is actually this would reduce some of the tribunal costs that local authorities face when people do appeal. And they can be quite significant for local authorities, which is ironically why some people, when they appeal, actually get their own way well before the tribunal case, because the local authorities will um, fold before they get to tribunal to avoid the cost of it, which is a ridiculous example of the sort of game nature of this application process sometimes. But also when you look at the um, number of care experienced children who end up getting excluded and therefore have to get put in expensive placements that will turn to provision placements, when you look at some of the other, if you like, longer term costs, we believe that if you put the support in an earlier stage for care experienced children, and therefore they're likely to have more chance of overcoming the barriers in their education at an earlier point, that you will avoid a lot of the costs later on um, and so it's really trying to get to the, the root cause of that rather than constantly focusing on the, the later term sort of symptoms um, that they emerge. I mean, I think looking at online petitions, um, I think that in some ways you, yeah, like, as you say, it's got the potential to be niche, but I think it's a common sense petition that a lot of people who are not necessarily directly affected, but have a sort of connected, maybe less tangibly will go, yeah, that makes sense. So I think it is, you could reach, I, you can reach 10,000 
to get yeah. just absolutely I, sure you can. I think so. I think actually, and you, I always say to myself, of, of all the people, because you get a lot of support from people that have experienced it themselves. You get a lot mm. of support from people that have been through a similar sort of journey or battle or sometimes. I think to myself, they've signed it, which is great. If they all got one more person to sign it, suddenly we double our numbers. If they get two family members to sign it, suddenly we're almost there. So it is not necessarily just those that have experienced it, but those who, who have seen it in, in close family or friends that have, have gone through this process. And I think what you said earlier is actually right. It can be exhausting at the moment. And it can also be a postcode lottery. And, and I really mean that because we looked at some figures um, and these are just for applications for educational healthcare plan assessments generally. But depending on where you are in the country, in 2020, the latest figures were four, the variation between local authorities as to how many assessment applications are granted or rejected is enormous. So in some local authorities, 0% of applications for assessment are rejected. So everyone who applies gets assessed. And in some yeah. local authorities, it's as much as 54% of applications get rejected. So depends where you live you could live in a local authority it's the same law but how it's interpreted by each local authority is very different and so you could happen to live somewhere where that local authority thinks you know what we're going to assess everyone that applies or you could live somewhere where over half of the applications get rejected and then you're expected to navigate an appeals process and a tribunal and all that sort of stuff and that seems really unfair particularly for those families with care experienced children yeah i mean I think we, we did a little poll because we knew you were coming on and it sort of to generate a few questions and a few different perspectives as well. Because I think that, you know, we're, you know, people can probably predict what we think about things. We're not particularly, <laughs> there's nothing very original in where we think. Um, and so we did a little poll which said, you know, this is the petition. It's about getting an, an assessment for um, an EHCP plan for previously looked after children. Um, and we were, I sort of in my head, I was thinking, um, uh, that he is that this is a no-brainer you know th there'd be no one who will go oh well that doesn't make any sense but actually we got i think it's 84 percent in favor and the rest <laughs> power of maths a bit nervous you're a teacher um 16 percent <laughs> said no that actually they didn't agree and then you dig around a bit and a few people have said well one is i'm just exhausted from this which was what you've reflected someone else said actually we're Already in adoption, we have the like in adoption, we have the right to be assessed for our children's needs. Doesn't mean you're going to get it. It's just if it's a right to assessment, it could be just starting a fight. And yeah. another view that someone else said, um, and which has just escaped my mind. Bear with me a second. I'll look at my little things. Um, and people sort of saying, actually, yeah, no, they, yeah, that that was the fighting for assessment. That actually they'd like they prefer to opt out, but actually you've answered that. You've said very clearly, yeah. if you want it. So yeah. how do you answer those sort of criticisms where people go, actually, I just, I don't think it is legitimate. Or have have people reflected other, what have the naysayers said to you? Yeah, I think I think that there are two main sort of naysayer ones that come back to me, and I understand them totally. One uh, tends to be from people who've actually got an educational healthcare plan, and they come back and say, mm. it's still really hard work. You know, they still, they might have it on paper, but it doesn't happen in practice. Um, and I think they're, they're a bit sceptical that, that the, the petition perhaps promises a false hope that actually, yeah, this will really help you to have your child's needs assessed at an earlier point than they would do otherwise. And therefore, you know, uh, it's all going to be OK. And of course, even when you've got an education health care plan, as we all know, it doesn't mean it's all right. And sometimes that provision isn't sufficient still. So it's not saying that this is the solution. It's just saying that this is reducing some of the delay and the lag in the time that you're likely to face if your child's been in care and therefore speeding up the process to, to create a bit more of an equality of opportunity compared to everyone else that perhaps is going for it. Um, but, but that's one reason that that tends to come back. The other reason that tends to come back a little bit is people are worried about labelling their children. And yeah. sometimes they fear that some sort of automatic right to, to anything could end up in their child being labelled in a certain way. And I think there are two things on that. Number one, um, we've been really clear it's upon request, um, not something that will be done to you, but an entitlement should you wish to use it. And I think that's a really important message to get across uh, to, to families um, in this position. Um, and the second one, of course, is that I can understand the apprehension and the concern that there might be 
uh, from some families about even going down a process of being diagnosed with a special educational need. Certainly in this sort of online full time, but international school that I'm in, 50 percent of our students are international. We do have some some students around the world and some regions that we serve around the world where we try and talk to, to, to parents and carers about special educational needs. And actually, it's quite a taboo still it's it can be in some places in some communities and our, our children are fine we, we don't want them to to be you know considered to be in need of additional support etc they're fine as they are so i think it's that there is still a little bit of a taboo and a labeling around it as well as concern that it's something that would be done to you i think what i'm trying to do is try and reassure people that it's neither of those two things yeah and it's interesting what you said there because i feel that even though two of my children had ehcps it was almost I wouldn't say a full-time job, but it was, it was almost a job in itself to make sure that the school was, or the schools, should I say, were actually delivering on what was written into a legal document <laughs> and agreed by the local authority. Because, I mean, an EHCP is written uh, as such to be a, legal, a, a legally binding document, isn't it? And to make sure that, you know, things like, um, so, so um, you know, in terms of strategies that were written into the thing, uh, into the EHCP to ensure that, you know, uh, I don't know, um, exclusion from a classroom or exclusion from school wouldn't happen. And if that sort of stuff started to happen, it was, it was a job in itself to be able to go into the school and say, actually, within the EHCP, you have said you're going to do this to stop that happening. And that hasn't happened. But you can't then take them out of the class kind of thing. So I guess... It, it's damn hard work. It is. I remember when when um, when we finally got the education and healthcare plan approved for our son. It almost felt like a celebration. They felt like, yes, we've done it, and we want to celebrate. We're really proud, and we're really pleased. We're so you know, grateful, and, mm. and we're really happy for him. And the and you're right. The, the first thing someone said to me was, "This is just the start." <laughs> this is not the end. <laughs> and it dampened the party like atmosphere slightly, but it was. Yeah. <laughs> It is true. It, it is not in itself uh, the end point, but it is something that hopefully yeah. will enable you to, to challenge and to champion and support. Um, and yes, it can still be extremely bruising and difficult and time consuming, but at least it gives you a foothold. At least it gives you a, a position up the ladder that you didn't have before. Exactly. Um, and, and that really is all we're asking for. Care yeah. experience children have a fair crack, a fair opportunity to get up that ladder to start with. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's laudable and I can't see a downside to it really. I mean, of course, if, if you kind of put your cynical hat on, you can. Um, so I, I think, you know, we, we'll add our, our limited weight to a bit behind the, the thing. And, um, but also I know things like the adopter reference group can raise that, which will yeah. push it up the agenda. Um, people like the fostering network, why would they not, um, to foster talk, yeah. um, so I think it's there's there's lots of people we can you know push that to, and I think getting ten thousand would be well within means and yeah create a bit of buzz around it. Um, yeah. In fact, as we were talking, I've tweeted uh, the the new, <laughs> the latest, <laughs> sort of, current. <laughs> yeah, who maybe wants to go and reflect on his um, his profile picture on his um, Twitter page, which. Uh, so we've got a new, ch- we've, uh, as we speak, by the time this goes out, who the hell knows what he's in charge? It could be Coco the Bleeding Clown at this rate. Um, we have got Jane Cleverly is the uh, Secretary of State for the de- Education Department. Will Quince, who we really liked, he's been put in <laughs> that charge of, he's actually been bumped up to a minister, and he's put in charge of standards for schools. Mm. So do you think he, right, so I'm interested, we're, we're amateurs at this education business. Come on, then. What's the word on the street down at the, at the water down in the staff the education room. world? Do you know? Do you know? It's total exasperation. It, it, people just when, when if you change head teacher as often as we change secretary of state for education, the school would be in special measures, wouldn't it? It, it would be a real cause for concern. And I think that people, parallel works. <laughs> Yeah, people just <laughs> think, yeah, look, it's, it's straightforward. People just want a bit of stability. We found it really frustrating because we were trying to lobby the, the team and the MPEs and the Department for Education around this petition ahead of the, the, the deadline um, for the, the SEN review, etc. Uh, and we were having a couple of meetings that were being lined up. And then suddenly, everyone was lined. It's all changed. New people. 
yeah, they're going to have 110 emails a day coming into them and you've got to try and build those relationships again. So, mm-hmm. yeah, when, when you're sort of campaigning for anything, it is really frustrating. Yeah. And it's really frustrating, I think, for, yeah, for schools, for teachers, for everyone else um, involved. Because I, I have no doubt the people that are coming into the roles will be really well-intentioned and well-meaning. But as, as, as you are when you start a new job, it takes you a while to, to get up to speed. And yeah. in that period of time, yeah, everything else comes to, to a standstill. Yeah. I, I believe mean, I, Will I, Quince. Uh, sorry, I was going to say Will Quince has retained um, his uh, the send review in his portfolio. I believe. So well, that's brilliant. And, uh, yeah, what would be great is if you can help us reach Will Quince because I know he was on recently and it, <laughs> it, was, it was great. Um, and we want to out. make sure that he is absolutely aware of this campaign and, and looks out for our response to the SEN um, review as well. All right. Well, I do have him on speed dial. No. <laughs> Good. Get him to join the call. That'd be fun. Yeah, I'll send him a, I'll send him a stern email. Um, I'm sure he's had a few um, of them lately. Yeah, I, I mean, it just feels really like that work, the time, the energy you've invested in that is it must be really frustrating as a as an educationalist. Yeah, you just want you just want to 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 know who you're working with. You want to know um, that there's some degree of stability i think people expect when there's like general elections people expect there's going to be change maybe but when you're yeah. only a couple of years in and you get this wholesale change it just throws everything out again it makes it harder i think for for there to be a level of trust um and i think certainly people in education feel like there's someone else to get to know you know what are their priorities what are their background what are their beliefs what are their values etc and to try and build those relationships again yeah you feel like you're going back to the start of the start of it all over yeah. really. I, I think I'd agree with you. As podcasters who, you know, had a, a minister on <laughs> and had a few false starts with previous ministers, shall we say, Al Coates' thumbs are going to be taken away from his keyboard the next time he has a bright idea like that. Because actually, you know, it was, it was a week <laughs> after the podcast. Oh. <laughs> I tell you, it's the curse of the... We had, it's the curse we've of had... you, the ministers. Yeah, me and ministers, every, something bad yeah. happens to one of us. So this time, in for, fortunately, it was Will. Mm. Um, first name terms now. Yeah, um, well, we, we didn't quite like him. He was, he was, he was, he was relatable. And once he, well, yeah, once he lost his uh, politician mode, he was actually a nice guy. We thrashed that out of him. And um, But what was interesting, and I think we were going to talk about this last week, but we forgot, um, we got lots of feedback from people saying, oh, I really, it really made me change my view of him. And then, you know, because he did warm up and, but it's just, oh man, really frustrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, you know, Rob, it's been fantastic to speak to you, and I have a feeling that we will be back. We will be back in touch with you as this. As the, it'd be nice to know when, because inevitably we are going to get a risk government response. We are going to reach you. Sorry, we you are going to reach ten thousand um, signatures, and it'd be lovely to get it back on when they get that response and see what comes of it, and and if we can add our shoulder to that wheel, that would be more than wonderful. Yeah, no. Yeah, thank you for supporting it and, and, and giving it a hearing as well, because it's sometimes difficult. There's so much going on and there's so many different campaigns or different priorities that different people have, particularly uh, when it comes to, to care experience, children and adoption, fostering, etc. that to try and make sure you're, you're respectful of everyone else, but you're trying to get your points across as well. It's really important. So this has been a great opportunity. It's been really nice to uh, share it with you. Yeah, Excellent. and um, having just signed it, can I just confirm as well, British citizens who do not live in the UK can also take part in it. So, you know, if you've got family and you live abroad, then, uh, yeah, you can do that as well. I have a feeling, though, on the other side is that there'll be lots of people going, uh, yeah, yeah, that's all well and good, but tell us about this school again that you're in charge of. How do we get our kids <laughs> into this school? This guy, we like him. So, I mean, is it open to the general public? Yeah, it is. Um, it is. Um... Online schooling has come a long way in a really short period of time. Um, and it's been really important to try and make sure it's accredited and quality assured because anyone could technically set up an online school, couldn't they? You know, and it's got to make sure there's real safeguards in it. So we've recently been credited as a Cambridge International School. It's called My Online Schooling. If you Google it, My Online Schooling will come up. It's one of the, the leading schools. Like I say, all types of students, all types of ages come into us. Uh, yesterday, I was hosting or, or judging even our My Online Schooling's Got Talent contest, our end of year talent contest. Over 300 students submitted their talent videos and we had um, yeah, a huge number of families sort of joining us wow. um, on Zoom for it. It was great fun. And you saw all these kids around the world. One of the great things about it is that you can be in one of our classrooms. And I, was, I went into one the other day. 
it was a geography lesson and the kids in there were really engaged they were debating at a certain point that the teacher had put up and there was a child one of our students in, in Kenya who was debating with one of our um, students that lived in Birmingham one that lived in the Scottish borders one that lived in France one that lived in Spain and that's their classroom so the culture and the richness of it is just amazing um, and we do have some benefits that, that physical schools can't offer. So we don't, um, we, we cap classes at 20. Um, so it's always small class sizes. All the lessons are live, but they're also all recorded. So if you do miss a lesson or if you're revising for exams, you've got all of those lessons to go to go back on as well. There's no disruption. There's no bullying. Um, there's no negative behaviour. So the progress you make in each lesson is, is, is greater. Um, and therefore the results tend to be higher. So for us, it's been a real journey, something we're really proud of. And we think actually to try and get that into the mainstream conversation that yes, you can go to a physical school, mm. but actually there is online school as an option as well um, is really important for education more generally, um, mm. particularly post pandemic when we've got more children than ever who are missing out on school. You know, you look at the attendance figures at the moment for schools and they're still at record lows. I think 86% last week attendance yeah. was the average in schools. There's a huge number of children that are for a whole host of reasons, whether it's mental health, anxiety, uh, other reasons, just simply not, able or comfortable to go into schools. And that shouldn't surprise us. Traditional schools, bricks and mortar schools were built for the 19th century. Um, and actually that same model is pretty much there now. Yeah. Uh, online schooling with the technology we've got, the experiences that we've got is something that should at least be part of the menu of, of the sort of choice that, that the yeah. parents and parents have. You'd maybe think that, I mean, uh, and I think Scott, we've talked about this before where we've seen that, th that there was, it wasn't as clear cut as all children hated online school. A lot of children thrived. I, you know, some of the children that I work with, in, you know, in fostering, some of those children got better results because the school went to online. Um, it just made, it, it took away all this kind of this white noise from their lives, and they could concentrate. And you think, how difficult is it for something like the virtual school? Because every local authority has a virtual school for them to set up a really modest version of that for yeah. that slither of children who that is just going to work it's yeah. yeah it's the future isn't it it is and i think it's, uh, we find it you talk about you often see headlines in the papers around sort of school staff retention crisis and all the school staff that want to go and 40 percent of teachers are looking to quit within five years and stuff like that and when we put a job advert out for a teacher we get hundreds of applicants and they're really good quality <laughs> because actually they, want, they want the work-life balance they like the idea of working from home they like the idea of not having to deal with disruptive behavior or difficult behavior they like the idea of helping students who otherwise would be missing out on education and therefore really being inclusive and in making sure students that would otherwise be struggling making great progress um and so we have really really high staff retention really good relationships with families um and like i say the biggest question that families give us is what about the socialization that that's the, the biggest yeah. question um and, and what's amazing for us is when we we talk and give them examples. Our students have online common rooms. There's extracurricular clubs. They're like chess clubs and stuff. They're just playing against people across the world, and they end up with this worldwide network of friends and peers mm. that they take with them into their their careers or whatever they do after school. That gives them a sort of global base of networks and, and people and some of the exchanges and the holidays they do. But we also do do a lot of physical activity. So we've got quite a few families in Dubai. So last month we did a big meetup, a picnic in the park for our Dubai families and had about 40 families there. Um, and so they then make their own groups. And, and for families and for young people that have got real hobbies and, and interests outside of their school, uh, this gives them a bit more time to focus on those as well. So yeah. yeah, for the right type of student families, it's an answer. It gives flexibility, it gives high quality, it gives good results and it gives uh, no no disruption. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the, the little adopter inside me is thinking um, if you had a child with additional needs, what, what, what's the story with your attendance? You know, you've said that some of the, the well, you've said the lessons are recorded. So, you know, if someone was having a particularly bad morning and, you know, there was, it was all kicking off, could they just join later? There's no issue with that. It's um... no, there's no issue with that. If we have anyone that doesn't attend, um, we do have so all of our families. We call them success coordinators. So they all have a, a, a someone in the school that's named person that looks after a certain number of families, mm. and they get in touch with the family and just check to make sure that, that, that the child's okay. If they can have any more support, and if it's actually, do you know what? They're just having a really bad day today. That's okay. Here's yeah. the here's the recording. Log on, have a look, complete the work, send it back to us. Um, and that student can still make progress. It's not like they've missed that lesson forever, which is unfortunately what happens in physical schools. Exactly, if you can't, yeah. If you can't I mean, go through the gate. 
Yeah, I mean, part of me is thinking this is a fantastic idea, and I'm not challenging the idea of it. But <laughs> as somebody who has a child with FASD and has this obsession with online stuff, whether that be YouTube is constantly playing on the telly or TikTok videos are getting played in my lug holes. I mean, is there a kind of a, a balance thing in terms of, you know, how you help parents to support their child not being online all the time? Yeah, absolutely. So what we what we find is that students make more progress because there's no disruption. There's not that start of the lesson, end of the lesson, people walking in, people walking out, staff absence, all that sort of stuff. And therefore, actually, the progress they make, they make more progress in shorter periods of time. So right. we help families to build a timetable. So they have a full time timetable, but there are different options of when in the day to do those classes. Right. Um, and therefore, actually, we fit it around the children and the families. But what we also do is make sure that if they've had a lesson, they then have a break off screen before they go right. into a lesson. So it's timetabled in a way that makes sure they're not just doing six hours back to back of yes. off screen. Yes. That wouldn't be healthy or, or right. Um, but actually, they don't need that amount of time because they make more progress in less time because of the lack of disruption. Yeah, because I think that was one of the things within um, when when schools were doing homeschooling, it was just from one lesson to the next, and if you weren't late, you were marked as absent. I mean, it was just like yeah, traditional up. traditional schools yeah. didn't know anything else. They tried to replicate exactly what they do physically, yeah. and mm-hmm. that was never going to work. And that's yeah. why um, there is some degree of specialism in the online provision yeah. with schools that are full time online that they, they can get that balance right. Yeah. We have classes. Some classes start at four a.m. for us if you choose that one because we have different yeah. time zones around the world that of course we cater for as well so we have some students that are joining us from the middle east or australia yeah. etc so we have different time zones. so again we had a family the other day that i was talking to in mexico and they live in a wildlife park in mexico um and and their children are with us uh, and they do their school and they sort of do their school in the evenings and the mornings because the, the, the middle of the day is really hot for them and so actually they wouldn't want their children to be in a physical school yeah. for that period of time there was a great example the other day and again it's a real range um, there was a great example the other day where we had a family and the parents had decided to take their two kids around the world for a year to do like a trip around the world. So yeah. But they wanted them to keep doing a bit of education. So we had a young man who sort of uh, logged into his science lesson and he was at the base camp of Mount Everest. And after he finished his science lesson, he was going off to climb it. And he, he was in the same classroom as you know, other kids from all different contexts. And, mm. and it, yeah, it's really special. You wouldn't get that in a physical school. Yeah. Sounds fab. Yeah. I might I think go back I would and do my GCSEs. Like <laughs> Sounds like a right laugh. Mm. Um, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. And um, as I say, we will no doubt get back to you. Um, where um, I've got my children are being for me to um, do something with them, so I'm going to have to shoot off. Uh, bless their little hearts. It involves my. I'm hoping my kids are asleep. I think that that's a false hope. Probably it's it's uh, we're str- yeah. we're struggling with sleep at the moment. It's so hot, isn't it? That our kids are. Uh, Meant to be going to bed, and about four hours later, they're still awake. How old are you? I mean, we should have, I should have asked at the beginning. What are the ages of your children? Um, so we've got 11, yep. 7, yep. 4, and 2. <laughs> I'm really pleased I remember that, because otherwise I would have been in trouble when I got home. <laughs> 11, 7, I'm more, 2. I'm more worried you're going to be a grandparent before you finish being a parent yeah. as well. Oh, my days. No. Yeah. That's not funny, Scott. <laughs> I think it is. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, Al. Did I, did I... <laughs> Too soon. Um... <laughs> wow. Excellent. You're going to be out well, this for years. I know. I didn't used to have grey hair, but it's coming through. It's flooding through now uh, on my hair. I don't know if it's a teaching or the, the, the being a dad. Oh, one or the other. <laughs> oh uh, you wouldn't believe I'm 27. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very hard to paper round. Um, right. Okay. Wonderful, Scott. Um, wonderful, Rob. Thank you so much for coming along and I uh, uh, hope everything goes well and we will be back in touch. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. you going to say anything, Scott? going to say goodbye? Can you be bothered? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I was, um, was texting my friend. No, I wasn't. I'm joking. <laughs> Bye, Scott. Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. <laughs> Honestly, it's like working with a child. <laughs>